Welcome to The Meaning of Catholic. My name is Angela Erickson, and I am the one of the hosts of The Ascent here on Meaning of Catholic, which airs somewhat infrequently on like Monday nights. <laughs> but also, I have my own YouTube channel called Integrated with Angela Erickson. And Tim Flanders asked me to post my interview with Dan Burke here on The Meaning of Catholic so that you can learn how to engage in meditative prayer, what that looks like. It was a really great interview, and uh, I'm just going to publish it the way that I published it on my own channel. But I wanted to let you know that's why this is showing up here on Meaning of Catholic today, and I hope that you enjoy it. And if you do, please head on over to my channel and subscribe. I would really appreciate seeing you guys over there. So anyway, thank you so much, and God bless you. Welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to bridge the gap between the intellect and the will so that we can grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. Hey guys, welcome back to Integrated. Thanks for joining me for another awesome interview. Today, I'm sharing an interview with you uh, with none other than prayer guru. I don't know if I should say that. Prayer guru Dan Burke. We're at, we actually do talk about Eastern spirituality and how it's kind of seeped into Catholic prayer and, and spirituality. This was just a really interesting interview. It took so many turns and twists that I wasn't expecting, uh, and we cover a lot of ground. So my goal was sort of that this would be an interview that sort of gives everyone a foundation on prayer. But really, what ended up happening is it became it became an interview that centered on understanding meditative prayer and the power of meditative prayer. And we talked about everything from Eastern spirituality and how that has sort of become problematic in Catholic prayer uh, circles, as well as just the traditionalist movement and where we're at right now um, and in kind of our failure so often to truly encounter the Lord uh, for other reasons and you'll hear all about that. But there were so many, I don't know, just so many nuggets. If you guys would do me a favor and comment in the section below first, you know, like the video, share it, do all that stuff. Of course, please like share. I have a challenge. Share this episode with three of your friends, like push that little arrow button forward and share it with three of your friends, especially during Lent to help them find ways to engage in, in true meditative prayer. I want Lent to be very fruitful for everybody. It's thus far, thus far been extremely fruitful for me. And admittedly, it's because I've ramped up my prayer life a lot. And this interview was very helpful for me in doing that and really sort of learning how to rest and, and contemplate our Lord and, and encounter him in a different way. So um, definitely would appreciate it if you did share it. Comment below what your favorite part of this interview was. I would really appreciate that. I love hearing from you guys. It's always a blast. And of course, if you have any comments or questions, even if you have a question for me, um, I think it would be kind of fun to start a, a, a question segment on some of my live shows where I can answer some of the questions that I get from you. Uh, so send me an email at Angela at integrated And you can always subscribe to my email list over on my website. So if you head on over to integratedangela.com, you can subscribe to my emails. I don't send out a lot of emails, but I figured for Lent that I would because I know so many of you are choosing to stay off social media for Lent. So I want to be able to keep you abreast somehow of all the things that I have going on, like the giveaway that I'm doing later this week because I finally hit a thousand um, followers on Instagram and I wanted to celebrate uh, and some other awesome stuff. So head on over to my website if you haven't already. Subscribe. Consider supporting my work on Patreon and joining me in there for a study on introduction to the devout life for as little as five bucks a month. Uh, and, and you get access, like extra access to the work that I'm doing. I'm trying to get better about being more interactive in there because I do appreciate so much that there, there are people out there that enjoy this podcast enough that they want to see it keep going. Um, and they, and they were wanting other people to find it, which I mean, it just blows my mind. So all of you who are my patrons, all of you who have sent in one-time gifts, thank you so much. I, from the bottom of my heart, 
thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot believe that that you make this possible. It just, I don't know. I can't thank you enough. I know I say that, but I really mean it. I don't really have good like words to say, and I I have a hard time knowing when to be quiet. So I don't know. Take that for what you will. But I hope that you enjoy this interview with Dan Burke. Please let me know what you think about it. And I do plan to have him back on because this interview kind of got cut short, surprisingly. So I guess I should warn you about that. Uh, he and and here's what I'll say on that too. I want to add this because actually it was a it was a very powerful learning moment for me. We get about 40 minutes into the interview and the Angelus bells go off for him and he tells me that he has to go because he has to pray the Angelus and he starts describing sort of this monastic life that he and his wife live. And it was kind of a gut check for me and maybe not for the reasons that you think. Um, I think like an old part of me would have felt uh, discouraged and kind of dejected feeling maybe embarrassed. Like, like maybe the reason he was leaving was because of me. Like, you know, that's, that would have been old Angela insecure and would have been kind of hurt maybe by that. So fast forward to now, I, I have just so much admiration for that because I know myself well enough to know that there are a lot of times in my life when I would have put prayer to the side if I was doing something like an interview because I would have wrongly perceived whatever I was doing, um, the sort of clout that maybe I was getting or attention, et cetera, et cetera. I would have viewed that maybe as more of a priority and, and told myself, I'll pray later. I will just shift my prayer time. And nine times out of 10, that just wouldn't have happened. So uh, I have to say, Dan Burke, thank you for showing me what it means to be convicted about your prayer life and being unwavering in that time with our Lord, because that was that was very powerful for me. And so for those of you listening, when we get to the end of this interview, I hope that that moves you as much as it moved me. So thank you for setting a wonderful example for us, Dan Burke, if you're listening. And I'm looking forward to having you back on the show. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this interview. God bless. Thank you, Dan, for coming on today to Integrated. I'm so thrilled to have you on this podcast to talk about prayer. Um, would you mind kind of introducing yourself, if there is anyone listening who maybe isn't familiar with you and your work, maybe sure. a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, so I'm a, a Jewish convert, I'm still Jewish, uh, but of course, a Catholic. Hebrew Catholic, and um, uh, came to Christ in a Southern Baptist church, found my way to the Catholic church eventually, and um, uh, really just uh, loved the church and and early on figured, discovered that there was a lot of uh, infiltration of non-Christian Eastern spirituality in the church, mm. and um, started a blog in 2009 called spiritualdirection.com to repropose Catholic mystical tradition that turned into my first Catholic book, which is a bestseller navigating the interior life. And then that those turned into the Avila Institute for spiritual formation. And we do priestly formation for 40 dioceses, um, one seminary. Um, we uh, vocational development as well. We have graduate studies in spiritual theology in 90 countries priest, religious laity. I guess we have readers in spiritualdirection.com in 190 countries. And then I uh, published a bunch of books on uh, the interior life. It's all about reproposing Catholic mystical tradition. So I, I lost count on the books. My latest is Devil in the Castle, uh, Teresa of Avila, Spiritual Warfare and the Progress of the Soul. So that's as fast as I can do it. Uh, yeah. I'm, sure <laughs> that's amazing. I'm sure I've missed something. Uh, my wife and I do divine intimacy and marriage retreats all based on Catholic mystical tradition. And um, we have a divine intimacy radio show, you know, so just all wow. kind of good stuff. Yeah. You, I mean, I think all of us, so many of us have really been touched in some way by your work. Um, and I think you're so right that Eastern philosophies have really infiltrated Catholic tradition. So maybe let's, let's talk about that. I kind of want 
this interview today to be somewhat of a, a quick foundations in sure. the prayer life. And I think understanding the history of prayer within the church is a really important key to understanding um, Catholic tradition and mysticism, especially with the likes of St. Teresa of Avila. So maybe could you describe some of the things that you've seen that, that you decided we need to combat this and reclaim our identity and authentic meditative prayer? Yeah, I think some of the biggest problems in the church today were are uh, in the set in the sixties and seventies. You know, you had a lot of Catholics drifting over to Eastern spiritualities that were becoming very popular because of the sexual revolution and all of the the exploration that was going on then. And so, some I think well intended priests who were very poorly formed, um, both in philosophy and theology and ecclesiology. Uh, were trying to solve the problem, and they, so they, because they were poorly formed, they didn't understand their faith very well. They looked at Buddhist, um, non-Christian Eastern practices, transcendental meditation, and kind of went, well, that sort of sounds like Teresa of Avila, and that sort of sounds like this, and I wonder if they're the same, and unfortunately, they came to a lot of really ill-informed decisions that are profoundly destructive, um, the most popular teacher of them is Father Thomas Keating, who's not even a Trinitarian um, mm. uh, in his belief about uh, the Godhead. And um, uh, he, he's gone to his eternal reward, God have mercy on him, but uh, created something called centering prayer, you know, so. Yes, and mindfulness, about, I feel yeah. like those terms, yes. Yeah, so they're well, and they're two peas in a pod. So centering prayer <clears throat> was in that first wave, and it is a, uh, a an absolute corruption of Catholic uh, teaching. And and I'll say this just in case some of your audience are listening. I'm not speaking off the cuff. Um, I've worked with scholars studying Centering Prayer, studying Keating's theology. I have every single book he's ever written. Um, it isn't that I don't understand. It's that if you're Catholic and you and you read his work, and I say this with respect to you. If you think it's Catholic, you 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 have an impoverished understanding of the Catholic faith, and I and I again I don't mean to be judgmental, but it's a lot of Catholics will say, "Well, I've been a Catholic all my life, and I read it, and I didn't see anything wrong." And I'm thinking, do you recognize the era that you grew up in? Mm -hmm. It's been a disaster uh, catechetically. So uh, so then fast forward to your mindfulness comment. We, we have another wave, you know, yoga now and a lot of, yeah. I mean, yoga was popular back then. A lot of, and, and the newest wave is to incorporate one of the Eightfold Paths of Buddha, which is mindfulness, and to try to equate it very similarly to what Keating did, although the major proponent of it is otherwise orthodox, whereas Keating wasn't. But um the uh, it to try to equate it with sacrament of the present moment, some of these Carmelite teachings, and it's just dead not. Uh, and 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 I also will say the same thing as I said before. I've worked with a Buddhist scholar, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Clark, and um, uh, uh, Olson from uh, Catholic World Report, who's really solid on Buddhism and investigated all the teachings of the most popular, what's called Catholic mindfulness. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's just snake oil. It's um, it helps you to, you know, listen, Buddha, Jesus doesn't need Buddha to give you the peace that he promised. That's what I was. Right. Everyone gets that. It's like, Oh yeah. Why would he need Buddha to give you the peace that he promised? Um, but they're, they're, they're just demonically inspired uh, there's a lot of money to be made in in mindfulness because it's 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 entered into pop psychology. But yeah. the thing about it is, uh, I I commissioned a book called um, sorry I'm rambling. I commissioned a book called A Catholic Guide to Mindfulness, where we looked at thousands of studies on mindfulness. I don't remember the total number, but it's a huge number. Evaluated by a secular institution that said it's just a vast array of junk science. Mm -hmm. This is secular people looking at mindfulness who are true scientists in the, in the psychological fields. <clears throat> and so, so now that's incorporated into Catholicism and, and called something good. And, and the problem is Angela, it actually does help people, but the question is to what end? To what end? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it, I've talked with someone, for instance, who uh, an Opus Dei member, devout Catholic woman, and she had all kinds of problems with anxiety and all of this, and it did help her calm her anxiety. I promise her, you, everyone listening, it will only work for a while because it is rooted in doctrines of demons. It is rooted in a purely earthly sensibility about how it is we come to peace rather than coming to peace because of our proximity to Jesus, because of the fullness of our faith, because of healing that can only come um, from God. And so they're like temporary band-aids that make people feel better, get them addicted to it, and then they get lost. That's so interesting because I I interviewed my friend Melody Lyons recently. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. Um, She very much is a former feminist as well, came back to her Catholic faith and and had a huge, um, you know, we all have our conversions, right? We Mm. all have our stories and what brings us back to the Lord. And uh, she was really into yoga. She said, Mm. I think she said she wasn't the best at yoga, but she adopted that mindset into her whole, her whole life and how she viewed the world in in her meditative prayer, so to speak. And she said it left her depressed and wanting to die because she had experienced these these types of mystical seeming experiences of getting lost in this unitive thing. You know, it's this this ambiguous, you're just you're floating in the ether and and having these mystical experiences. And then she'd come back and be so depressed and just want nothing more than to be completely detached. And so it, it threw her into a lot of really horrible things. I mean, cause she just, obviously we're, we're human. We, we have bodies, we have souls and, and they're intertwined. And so um, I think it's really interesting that that's basically what you're describing, but people might not see that, you know, they might not see uh, that end because in the moment, like sin always does, it feels good, right? Yeah, it, it does. And in your, what your friend experienced, by the way, another secular source, there's a book called the Buddha pill, which is a secular study of the practice of yoga and mindfulness and these sorts of things. And they document people absolutely, completely, and totally losing their minds. Hmm. You'll never find that in the history of the church. Anyone who loses their mind, who spends time with Jesus in prayer, Hmm. who uh, immerses themselves more deeply in the sacraments of the church. The only thing you find with people who do all of that is healing, stability, joy, maturity, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So... I guess then that this is a good time to talk about the different forms of prayer, right? Because sure. we could talk about contemplative, meditative, but also, you know, prayers of Thanksgiving, prayers yeah. of contrition, all those things. So would you mind talking a little bit about that? Um, yeah. Because I think we're so uninformed. We just aren't formed in this the way that we should be as Catholics. Well, I think, you know, it depends on the audience that you're talking to, but probably the least informed of all the forms of prayer whether you're a traditionalist or an ordinary form, run-of-the-mill Catholic, is mental prayer. Yeah. And mental prayer uh, has been around, you know, since the beginning of the church and before even. And it's just simply the practice of filling the heart and mind with God. And so you see that, of course, in the Psalms, beautifully depicted, where David is, uh, I love the repetitive Psalms, where, you know, he talks about your mercy endures forever and all of the glories of God, and just this... That this... vain repetition, Dan? Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> right, vain. Yeah, yeah. oh gosh, it's in the Bible, isn't it? I oh, no, <laughs> oh, what a mistake. Um, no, Somebody uh, better tell God, the divine right, author. Right. You know what's yeah. funny about that? I, what you, you just said is important. Jesus, this you'll never... I, the only class on prayer I've ever heard anybody do this is my own. Jesus begins by saying, don't pray like the pagans. Mm-hmm. So why are we going to mindfulness... Why are we going to the, the, the centering prayer nonsense and mantras? Why are we doing this when yeah. the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when they said, Lord, you just pray. He said, don't pray like the pagans. And then, and then, of course, we have in Paul, he says that those religions are formulated out of doctrines of demons. Hmm. It's like, so, you know, and, and, and Jesus himself says, don't repeat vainly. Or, uh, and what does he mean by that? Well, the pagans thought by many words, they would be heard or by formulas. You know, we see this also in the great battle with Isaiah and the prophets of Baal, cutting themselves and yelling and screaming, and he mocks them rightly. And and so Jesus says, that's not the realm of prayer that we want to be in. We want to be in the realm of prayer where 
we can speak to God as our father, right? Mm -hmm. We can say to him, hallowed be thy name. Your name is glorious and good and holy and true. May the entire universe praise you. Thy kingdom come in my heart and in the hearts of every human being you created for an eternal relationship of love. This is the effusion of prayer that Jesus is trying to teach us that is very personal with God, um, very much fills our hearts and minds, whereas in the non-Christian East and all non-Catholic prayer, it's emptying the mind, controlling thoughts, mm. rather than filling and, and absorbing, being absorbed in things. So mental prayer is this idea of uh, spending time. It, it begins usually, Lectio Divina, I think, is the best mm-hmm. structure for it where you want to get to know Jesus, so you spend time reading the Gospels, you spend time reflecting on what's happening in the Gospels, trying to learn about you know, how Jesus acts towards others and what he values and what, what uh, troubles him, what, mm-hmm. what, what he says to people. And so you enter into that reality, you come to know him, it increases virtue, decreases vice by definition, Right. By the, it's just the very act of spending time with him. You, you, you fall more fully in love with him, which gives you strength and passion and energy to follow him. Um, that's the realm of mental prayer, the most neglected form of prayer. The others, there's a lot of teaching about you should ask for things from God, of course, petition. Um, you should praise him, of course, uh, which we also have in the, in the great tradition of Psalms. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think mental prayer is the most neglected and I would say this, um, several doctors of the church, including Aquinas, uh, St. Alphonsus Liguri in particular, St. Teresa of Avila, all say that it's necessary for your salvation. Yeah. But, but what's scary is most people don't even know what it is. Mm-hmm. That's, and yeah, I, I'm, it's interesting because I've been reading A Preparation for Death by St. Mm-hmm. Alphonsus Liguri. Oh, gosh. I've just been that's slowly a, making that's a good my life book. It is. And uh, well, I, um, I've shared about it on my show, but my, my sister passed away in a, in a very, it's just a, a sudden fatal car accident, um, seven years ago on her way to my house. And so, I'm very sorry to hear thank that. You. yeah. Um, you know, I have a, I have a great deal of consolation that she had come back to the church at least, mm-hmm. and even had intentions to get more involved in her parish, which mm-hmm. after kind of adopting a socialist Marxist ideology in college and becoming wow. pro-abortion and leaving the church was huge. Um, praise be to God. And, um, but, but again, like leading up to that, I had really felt strongly called to seek out an understanding of suffering. And I think the only way you can understand suffering is through prayer. Right. And, and uh, the Lord really prepared my heart in some ways, but then Mm -hmm. afterwards you don't, you don't experience something like that and, and not be totally changed. And so realizing how fragile life is. And yes, even contemplating the four last things, we have a duty to do that. And I think in mental prayer is really the only place you can do that, where you can explore and examine what your end will be like and prepare your heart for that. And and so it makes sense that that is the only way to salvation because you're left totally unprepared if you are not thinking about those things. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're making a good point. I, th- I think um, proximity to Jesus is distance from all that keeps us from eternal glory and the beatific vision. Um, I mean, proximity to Jesus is proximity to all. Yeah, distance from everything that keeps us. That's right. right. <coughs> I said it right. It sounded great, and then I messed up. <coughs> but um, yeah, I mean, uh, why was why was uh, why are the saints the saints? Yeah, it's because they they come to know Him, they fall in love with Him. You know, to me, the best way of thinking about all this is is go back to the first century. What would it be like to walk with Jesus? You know, what would it be like for Angela and Jesus to be walking side by side between Jerusalem and Jericho? What would they talk about? You know what they would talk about? They, yeah. they, Jesus would say, Angela, you, you're beautiful to me. I'm so proud of you. You know, I, I've seen what you've done with your life and, and I've seen uh, how much good that you're doing. And then, and then maybe the next morning, because you didn't make the whole walk, everyone gets up and, you're walking in again by the stream, and he says, "You know, Angela, there's this thing that that's that's keeping us apart, and I'd like I'd like your permission to heal it." Mm. And you say to him, "Yes, Lord, can you show me 
I, I, I don't want anything between us. And he would say, Angela, you know, it was, it was this thing that this choice that you made and it lingers in your soul and, 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 it, and it hinders you from seeing, from understanding this aspect of me. And, and uh, mm. you know, that's mental prayer. That's, that's right. what happens. We're walking, living with Jesus. And so whether it be our last end, you know, you know, you, you, you certainly those conversations happen in Matthew 7, 22, right? Jesus. I said, was just reading that last night. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, Jesus says, hey, let me show you what your last judgment's going to look like. Yep. And he says, you're going to call me Lord. You're going to cast out demons in my name. You're going to do all this good. I tweeted this out. I'm not kidding. I That's tweeted awesome. this out last night. You can go on my Twitter. Oh, I, I last you. night. The That's Lord awesome. is, is just amazing here. Kicker in that passage, the thing that's so difficult is, he says, but I'm going to say I don't know you. And, and it's so confusing to people. But if you know the word know, where it comes from, that word was a translation. So, that, so when the Jews translated the Old Testament into the Septuagint, which is Hebrew to Greek, they used the same word that Jesus used right there of no when they said Adam knew Eve in the garden. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what Jesus is saying is you're doing all these external acts that are good, but we don't know each other. Yeah, we're not intimate. You know, not there's, intimate. there's not an intimacy there. Particularly problematic in my own realm, which is a uh, traditionalist movement. Oh, you know, yeah. We, we, we love the liturgy. We love devotions. We love all this stuff. And, but, but we can become Pharisees and hear the yes. rebuke of Jesus rend your heart, not your garments. Yeah. Stop dealing with the external. Yes. You know, yes, I have heard the same thing. You know, it makes me think of a conversation I saw recently. Of course, again, Twitter, it's just a cesspool, and yet uh, there I am. I don't know yeah. why. You know, I saw this discourse happen where somebody was insisting, for example, that your rosary is not legitimate unless you are kneeling and you say it all, all 15 mysteries, like on your knees in prayer, wow. and, and, and was very insistent. And I wow. thought, I have... You have you have popes walking. It's pa Saint Padre Pio walking and praying the rosary, like Good. praying, literally praying without ceasing. And you're telling me that the only way to salvation and that the only way you can have a real conversation with God is, which I mean, I love the rosary. Yeah. You know, that's. But I'm a mom of five kids. Am I yeah. sitting there kneeling every day praying my rosary? Sometimes my best rosaries happen in the car because they're all strapped down. Yeah. And they can't interrupt me, you know, wow. or they can join me. As someone, I've been involved in exorcism ministry and studied witchcraft and all of this stuff. And as someone who's been involved with that, I can tell you a lot of that sort of thing is the structurally the same as witchcraft. Yes, it, it, it's, it's a formulaic it, thing again, right? Like, again, and yeah. not believing that God's grace. I tell people, even within the sacraments and sacramentals. Yeah. Yeah. God doesn't need the sacraments and sacramentals. We do. He gives them to us as a grace. It's a free gift of his mercy yeah. so that we can live in accordance with him. He's giving us a path and mm -hmm. a way to him. Like what father <coughs> would say, just be with me, but wouldn't tell you how. Right. That would be cruel. That would <coughs> right. be cruel. Right. Um, that's not the kind of father that I, I would imagine, um, you know, and I don't think Catholics really believe that. That's, that's cruel. That leaves people lost and wandering. Um, right. And that's not what our Lord wants. He wants us to follow the narrow path to him um, so that we can be with him as our, at our end, to be with him, to know him, love him, and serve him in this life and in the next. Can I beat um, up that idea a little bit too? Go like, ahead. Yeah. So one of the dumbest things I've ever seen on prayer, ever, <laughs> it, was, it was on I like where this is going. It was with this monk named John Maine. And and I don't usually like to name names, but these guys just spread all this bad junk. Yeah. And, and the secular news media loved it. It was a secular news. And I thought, okay, that's of a Of course bad they line. loved it. Yeah. Secular news loving something Catholic, doubt it's legit. Yeah. So then, so then this guy is walking around the room teaching these people how to pray. So this is very similar to you must kneel, right? Just think about this. And he's going, well, you have to have you know, perfect posture. And so as he's, as he's teaching them to pray, to help them to pray, he goes up to this one guy and he adjusts his shoulders back a quarter of an inch with this sort of smug look like he just did something amazing. And of course, that's going to help the person pray. It is, it is absolutely ludicrous. And here's the thing. Let me just blast this one way out of the water. If you pray, in the, so what is the purpose of the rosary? It's for Mary to lead you to Jesus. I pray the rosary every day and I have for a long time. Mm 
So, so no, so, and I wrote a book about the rosary. So I'm dead serious about it. But here's the thing. If you say, if you open up one of my favorite uh, of the mysteries is um, uh, the, uh, the visitation to Elizabeth, mm-hmm. you know, our father who art in heaven, you begin to pray the rosary. If, if you are in that moment, then by God's grace, taken to an encounter with Mary and, and going to Elizabeth and, and taking Jesus there and, and suddenly you're there in the room and all that, and you stop saying the words, but you're experiencing the reality and you do nothing else with the rosary, you don't finish it, you will have more graces than you than you've than you've received in a hundred rosaries. Right. Because you're entering into the mystery, which is what it's supposed to do. Right. And finishing it. This formulaic nonsense of you got to be postured an exact certain way, you've got to finish it, is witchcraft at at its structure. Not Mm -hmm. saying the rosary is witchcraft, because I know. No, no. But I'm saying it's 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 a demonic way. It's a demonic twisting of a beautiful, glorious, and one of the most important uh, devotions in the Catholic Church. And people don't realize what, what the source of those inspirations are. That turns you into a Pharisee. It turns you into someone that Jesus is going to say at the end, I don't know you. You know, you 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 were one of the 10 virgins, but you didn't get it. Right. You, you're missing an interior relationship with me. Anyway, I can ramble. No, right. absolutely. I just, I think, you know, more, because I'm, I'm traditionalist as well. I mean, I, I'm sure many would pe- people would say I'm not traditional enough. You know, oh. I love the, the traditional liturgy. My mm-hmm. husband and I do. It's, it's beautiful. And a lot of that is because of the posturing, the symbolism, things like that, because our bodies are made and, and we were created to have our bodies express our interior dispositions. Totally. Right. So there's, it's not to say that there's nothing to that, but we're also human. Right. And, and life, the Lord has, has us in this life and Mm -hmm. and life is chaotic and it's imperfect Mm -hmm. and we are imperfect. So we strive the best that we can. And the Lord takes that, that meager offering and he accepts it from us. Yeah, totally Um, agree. I I think the chosen is the best art of our time to You think so? Ooh, that's a hot take. Oh no. Well, and let me, and let me, let me irritate some of my traditionalist friends. (laughs) <laughs> Some of the most ridiculous criticisms of the chosen are out. I don't have any issue with it because I understand art. Every crucifix, every icon, everything that's been depicted to try to help us visualize and see the truth of the gospel is flawed. Every conception across all time has been flawed in its depiction. So is the chosen flawed? Yes. Is it also gloriously true? Yes. Right? So, if you if you want to learn mental prayer and you want to learn the humanity of Jesus, and is the humanity perfectly represented? No. Is his divinity perfectly represented? No. But if you're if you're going to run around doing that, you're going to miss the essence of the thing because you can find error in mm. anything, and you're going to yeah. miss. You, you don't understand art, not you, but you know <laughs> people who criticize it. I mean, I remember you know one one one. I hate to say this. I don't like criticizing priests. One priest said. If you go watch the chosen, you're going to go to hell because it misrepresented Mary. And I'm thinking, dude, you're a Thomist. Aquinas got a key doctor to Mary wrong. Not comparing Aquinas to Dallas Jenkins. Don't right. Worry, brother. right. <laughs> but he got it wrong. So you're going to throw out Aquinas? You right. know, it's just the line. Well, you, you don't need to throw out. the baby out with the bathwater, right? I, gosh, I mean, it's like epically bigger. Yes, but it's so irrational. Um, <laughs> it's so irrational. It, and it's so. You know, a lot of traditionalists um, came the way I did, like we're Novus Ordo refugees, right? Yeah, Where, 100%. You know, we we, we want to exit the goof farm. There's a lot of beautiful priests and people in that realm, and, and I don't even have uh, hardly any access to the Latin mass at this point. But um, so there's a lot of, you know, I'm not just wholesale saying it's all terrible, but 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 it, you enter in the traditionalist world and you think, well, it's the mass, yes, central, you know, that's the, the center point. That's the epicenter of all grace. But and and the rubrics and, and the beauty and the structure and the in the chant and the or the or the silence in the in the in the low mass, all of that. And the, and that's Catholicism to them. That's and and wow, 
you know, there's so much radiating out from the Eucharist um, that permeates this incredible, beautiful, you know, thousand plus year old tradition that converts to, if you will, traditionalism don't know they get fixated on this tiny, you know, spectrum, which is very important mm-hmm. and good and, and the most important in many ways, yeah. but miss all of the other grace that flows through the divine economy. Because I think they miss the point. They get so caught up in the, in the detail that they lose sight of what it's all ordered towards, right? Exactly. The reason it's supposed to be beautiful is because Jesus is present. Yes. And his heart is, uh, this is, we had a really interesting conversation with, with my in-laws this weekend because they're fundamentalist um, Christians who have adopted a rapture theology and they want to save right. my husband and I. And I, I, uh, I just, you know, we ended up talking about the Eucharist and I said, I got pretty passionate because they actually laughed in my face when I said, you know, early Christians, they died for the Eucharist. This is not, this isn't Angela speaking. This isn't the church of Angela. This is tradition from the time of the apostles and, and those within living memory of the church. And I said, you can laugh all you want, but that's the truth. And I look at the Eucharist and I see that is the heart of Jesus. And he's giving us his heart every time we go to mass and we ask him, we beg him to make our hearts like unto thine. And, and that's why the mass is supposed to be beautiful. That's why we're supposed to express with our bodies in a, in a physical way, that interior disposition. But how do we cultivate that in a way that radiates to the world, the goodness, truth, and beauty of the liturgy of the Eucharist? Well, and if you're not worshiping Jesus and you're worshiping the rubrics, yeah, you're not going to. I, and, and I even had this conversation with a very well-known Catholic. I won't say his name because I like him, but he's he's left the, the mm-hmm. faith. But he was one of he was a prominent traditionalist, prominent um, guy. And I once said to him in a private conversation, I said, I said the I, the rubrics are not God; they lead us to God. And he said, mm-hmm. I don't even understand what you're saying to me. And it was a fascinating conversation. And I know that I know the person never had a habit of mental prayer, mm-hmm. but they were passionate about an ideology rooted in truth, of course, and a, and a, and a way of looking at tradition and structure that they had, a, they had really <clears throat> absorbed, but they made it all God. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, but they didn't know the one who was behind it all really. Mm in a substantive way. And of course they just got frustrated because of how crazy things are and they um, gave up. Yeah. And I think we all have that. um, We all have that in us, right? Like if we're not staying near to the Lord, um, we all have that propensity to walk away when, when it gets really difficult because we are creating different idols, you know, yeah. and just like the Israelites, they created idols. The second Moses was gone, you exactly. know, conversing no, with we, God, we, we, we have that in us. We're gifted at creating messes in ourselves and around us. We really and are getting lost in the messes in ourselves and around us. And instead of uh, always drawing near to the Lord. So when we are seeking to draw near to the Lord, how do we differentiate between our own emotions and our own, like for me, for example, I tend to be more scrupulous. And so I second guess a lot of the things that I'm saying in prayer because I'm afraid that it's just me talking to myself and cycle. Like, so then there's the psychoanalysis that happens. Um, But how do we really discern between what we're moving in our own hearts versus what, how God is interacting with us and engaging us? Okay, so you're asking one of the most common questions I get asked. And there's not an easy answer, but I can give you a pathway to that answer. Hmm. And I'm not trying to sell books because I give away the vast majority of uh, what, we, what we bring in. Mm-hmm. Um, Into the Deep, Finding Peace Through Prayer, you know, teaches Lexio Divina. When you are in the Gospels and you hear something that corresponds to the beauty, goodness, and truth in your interiority that you're reading about. Um, and it and it sounds like Galatians 5. You're, you're probably closer to God's voice than otherwise. Now, I also wrote Spiritual Warfare and Discernment of Spirits and Devil in the Castle. Both of those books are discernment books, fundamentally. 
Uh, one is through the uh, scripture and the Ignatian lens on testing every spirit mm. and learning the effects of the spiritual. So you remember what you, you said about your sister, God rest her soul. She would go, if I'm remembering right, you know, she would go into the yoga thing and then come out with this desolation is what Ignatius would call it. <clears throat> well, that's a sign. <clears throat> desolation is a sign that you've come in contact with the enemy, not with the King of Kings and the Lord of right. Lords. Consolation, assuming you're moving from good to better, you're not moving from habitual sin to habitual sin. Consolation, ten, the tendency is that if you experience consolation, which is um, the, the theological virtues, um, uh, faith, hope, and love, and their manif various sub-manifestations, that's going to be, you're nearer to God in that cogitation or, or that whatever you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Now, Devil in the Castle deals with mystical experiences like locutions and visions and, and all of that. In the end, um, the test is, does it lead you to humility? Does it lead you to love God more? Does it lead you to love others more? If, if those things are true, you're generally probably in the right place, but, you know, read the books. They're, 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 um, they draw from the, you know, wisdom and guidelines of the church. The only thing you should worry about in a bigger way is if you, is if you're praying and you hear do something, take some action that's not, that that's beyond yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that should always be tested with someone. And, and it is more complicated than I'm saying, and it's also more simple than I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But if but if you're if you're hearing love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self control, <clears throat> anything that leads you to those things, you're in the realm of the Holy Spirit. If you're hearing doubt, despair, and narcissism, anxiety, a lack of peace, you know, unless you're in mortal sin, that's mm -hmm. a caveat because when you're in mortal sin, the good spirits will actually make you uncomfortable. Right, and the bad spirits will try to uh, ease you uh, with memories of your sin and the and the the inebriation uh, related to the sin, which mm -hmm. creates a kind of false temporal peace, which you also mentioned uh, regarding your your sister. Mm -hmm. So those are those are some of the ways. Um, does it lead you to God, to holiness, to love for Him and others? You know, that's the kind of the the, the the core does it lead you to humility and then it's it's probably the lord and i wouldn't worry about it too much you know you're a woman of goodwill you're seeking him you're in the church you're 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 immersed in the sacraments you're immersed in your own state in life which by the way is protection for you as well hmm. um uh trust him as you do all of that reality because i hear you're very intelligent and you're forming yourself very well i hear a lot of good theology behind everything you say, a lot of good philosophy behind what you say. So there's all kinds of beautiful, good things going on in you. And you can trust him that he will show you when you're in error mm. as you walk on the way. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think too, this really highlights the importance of having a properly formed conscience. Mm -hmm. And so when we're trying to engage in meditative prayer and be properly discerning, yeah, how does one go about it? Let's say you grew up in an environment where it was very tumultuous and very chaotic. You weren't properly catechized and you're just kind of, you're, you're starting to see that for the first time. You know, the Lord is so gracious to us. He draws us ever so gently. He doesn't throw everything in our face at one time. So how does one go about starting that process of having a properly formed conscience so that they can they can encounter our Lord in a in a full way? In, in a safe way. Yeah. I mean, obviously the catechism, uh, the Roman catechism, the modern ca catechism is also very good. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the writers, one of the pr pr primary writers, was I believe a mystic and, and a very um, uh, beautiful, beautiful soul. Um, it, those two catechisms together, but you can do a catechism in the year. Uh, uh, in a year is a mm -hmm. great thing to do. Um, reading the doctors of the church, uh, or people like me who who dwell on the doctors of the church, um, can can help you. I, I think if I could recommend two, if you said to me, okay, Dan, 
you, you, there's just too many books. So give me two. I would I would say uh, for newbies, for because of applicability, not you know Trent is much more clear. The Roman Catechism is much more clear because of anathemas and like really hard boundaries than the the, the, the John Paul II Catechism. But but the but the, the, the modern Catechism is more applicable in a in a general sense in our time. They they, they should be read together, mm -hmm. but. But if I just had to pick one for a newbie, it would be the modern catechism. And then I would read a book called I would I would read a book called The Better Part. And I'm gonna I'm gonna grab it so I can show people. It's a four volume set that um, I've been keeping in print for a long time now uh, by Father John Bartunek. And I, I don't know if you can see that very oh, well. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it is what it does is, is it's all the gospels, and in every gospel, it has um, uh, a reflection on Christ the teacher, Christ the friend, Christ the Lord. On oh, every beautiful. Passage. That sounds beautiful for somebody, too. Like, we have just this, you know, so many broken homes where fathers are not there, and so, mm -hmm. like... I've, I've experienced that firsthand of trying to understand how to have a relationship with God yeah. because I don't understand what it's like to have um, a present protective father in that yeah. way, you know? So it's hard to relate, you know, it yeah. feels like, and I know yeah. I'm not the only one, you know, you're trying to understand these relationships and uh, you feel like you're, you're, you don't want to delude yourself. Um, especially when those wounds are so deep of, of, and so many of us have them just feeling unworthy, um, oh, yeah. you know, and so th that just sounds like a great uh, book to sort of help round that out. For well, I grew up in abuse. Listen, I understand abuse in my spiritual warfare and discernment of spirits book. I opened with two scenes, mm. you know, uh, um, my, my stepfather um, beat my mother, terrorized us, fired a gun in our home, Oh Lord, have um, mercy! I'm so just, sorry. Um, I lost. I have. I have siblings in caskets um, because of drugs and um, neglect. Um, so I know what that's like. And but here's the thing: Why is it that I'm not insane? Is it because of counselors? No. Is it because of medication? No. It's because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And and <laughs> I could I could weep uh, telling you. When you draw near to him, scripture is not just ink and paper. It's the living, breathing word of God. And when you absorb that in your mind, you know, in, 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 in Corinthians, uh, St. Paul says, we war not against flesh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Um, uh, and we have divine power, he says. Angela and Dan and everyone listening has divine power to destroy what? So we're in a war. We have divine power. It's demonic. But what's happening? Strongholds are built up in our mind. What are those? Lies. Mm. Lies. You and I are both told lies over and over. I, well, I don't know anything about your background. I'll just say it for me. I was, I was not loved. I was, not, I was loved in a very sick way. Mm. And, and, uh, and I don't blame, you know, my, my dad was a decent man, my birth father. But he was, his dad was a philanderer. His mom was single, you know. So you, you just get all these distortions. But St. Paul says you can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You have divine power to destroy strongholds. He said in Romans, be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And as a young Christian, I'm going, what is this? And it's absorbing yourself in scripture, absorbing yourself in church teaching, in the sacraments, in reconciliation, and he will heal you. He will heal your heart. He'll heal your mind. Um, I've never been helped any other way than that way. And, and it's made me sane. And honestly, mm -hmm. most of my family, you know, unfortunately, my youngest brother will probably die under a bridge, mm -hmm. you know. And as I said, I've lost um, a lot. But God be praised when we draw near to him, he, 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 he says, I will draw near to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Knock and the door will be opened. Yeah. yeah. And it's he's just waiting. Us. Yes. Yes. And you know what? The Angelus bell just went off and I have to go pray. 
Well, I will let you go. <laughs> you know what? Thank you so much. This was just such a lovely interview. And yeah. I will definitely be encouraging everybody to buy your books. I'm very grateful to you and everything that you are doing over at all of your apostolates. You have yeah. several. Um, yeah. So I'll link to all those in the description as well. Awesome. I'm sorry to cut us off so quick, no, but uh, we have stations and uh, mass and uh, liturgy of the hours. Uh, we're, we live a uh, quasi monastic life here. Wonderful. Um, which is such a grace. Yeah. Really, really need to get to talk to you and, and happy to come on again anytime uh, where we can find a slot. Thank you for all the, the good you're doing. Uh, it's so, it's so obvious the Lord's at work in you. And I'm really, really grateful to have the, 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 the privilege of meeting you. Thank you so much, Dan. I mean, yeah, that's an honor. So thank you very much. Very grateful for this time. So God bless you. And uh, you. I'll be praying for you. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.